Welcome to lecture six. The subject is triggers and built-ins. The objectives for this lecture are to cover trigger basics, creating triggers of various types, and forms built-ins. Uh, now, unlike database triggers, which respond to insert, update, and delete of records, a form trigger responds to a form-related user or system event, which means that um, there actually have quite a wide range of possibilities for forms triggers, and we're going to go over what those are. So the types of events that we're talking about are basically two types of events. An interface event, which is generally something which is done by the user, how the user is interfacing with the form. So there is an, um, an object on the form which the user is, is, um, is changing or clicking on or something. So that's like pressing a button or check, clicking a checkbox or even tabbing from one item to another. And then you have internal processing events. And what I mean here is um, an event which occurs as a result of runtime processing means forms runtime processing, not necessarily database processing. And so these could be like validating a record, which is making sure that the record uh, meets certain criteria, leaving the record, or going from um, creating a block to be you know, set up for inputting new data. Now, there are two ways to look at triggers. Uh, there are two ways that we can classify them. We could classify them by type, which means that we're organizing them according to the function that they perform, or by name, organizing them basically by the, the prefix on the name. So I'm going to go over the basic uh, type categories and give you a brief introduction of what some of them mean. and. Uh, the thing about triggers is you really want to be familiar with all the triggers that are available to you so that as you decide your form and you decide what it is that you want to do uh, on your form, you realize what your options are. And to be, you know, basically with forms you have a great deal of options. And when you apply them on the internet, you have even more options because you'll see uh, uh, we're not going to cover that here, but there, there are even more possibilities there, and there's, there's an opportunity to make use of Java code, and there'll be more and more of that. So getting back to the, the trigger type categories, we have block processing. Now this is like when creating a new record. That's processing which is occurring on a block level. An interface event, which means the user is clicking on a button, then we need a when button press trigger to handle what code we want to take to fire when the user uh, presses that button. And then, uh, for example, master detail uh, triggers. We went over that in the master detail lecture. And then something like message handling, unhandling a message, which is being returned. Um, and that continues with navigational. Now, navigational is, uh, as the word sounds, as the user is navigating with a tab button or whatever from one item to the next. And then you can. Uh, you can fire whatever code you want as he moves from one to the next. And then um, <clears throat> query time, post-query. Now this would be like after the query has taken place, the database items from the data block, say the student table. And if you also had items on, um, maybe this was student update form, so you may also have like uh, the city and the state that go along with the zip code, uh, but you didn't put the you didn't make that master detail because you don't want them to be able to update the, the association of city and states to the zip code. So you may have been want to have some display items, which are not database items, and have the values filled in after querying, which would be done in post-query. Now that happens immediately. The user will not see any kind of delay on what occurs on a post-query unless it's you know a very complex query. Transactional is like on insert. There's different types of transactions. You're, you're familiar with basic data. What is database transaction? And um, this is at, occurring at the time of a transaction. When validate item is a validation trigger. This means validating the value of uh, what has been inserted uh, or what has been entered in that field. And now we're going into uh, the, the other way of categorizing triggers, which is the name, the name categorization. So basically, we have two here. We have the when event triggers. This is important to realize the distinction. A when event trigger augments default form processing, which means that 
it allows the, the default form processing to occur, and then it adds this on top of it. On event triggers, on the other hand, replace form processing, which means that if you have an on event trigger for like on insert, then whatever the form is normally doing for the insert, it's not going to do. Instead, it's going to replace it with the on uh, trigger that you've written. Um, and then pre-event triggers that fire just prior to a when event or an on event. And post-event triggers, they fire after the when event or the on event. Now, key trigger is one that replaces a key, like, say, F9 is something that uh, opens the LOV, uh, which we'll, we'll discuss in the next chapter. And um, if you say uh, this is a date item, and you have a whole series of forms that you have that <clears throat> give a, like a little calendar, and the user takes the date, and then it's going to return that calendar. You're probably seeing these on a lot of web applications. Um, then this will that you may want to do this to replace the key that normally triggers the you know opening up the LOV. Now it's important to realize both in those triggers which I just discussed, I, I was I was pointing out, you know, the occur the hierarchy, which one comes first and which comes next. And this is important to realize because as you're writing your triggers, you've got to realize the movement from one trigger to the next so that you know what the values are going to be of different variables, different bind variables, and how you're going to handle that. And uh, realize, too, that this is not uh, like a PL SQL procedure, which just runs from beginning to end. Um, this is based on different types of events. So a lot of your triggers are not ever going to be executed. This depends on what the user is doing and what's occurring on the form level. So triggers are attached to specific objects. And what this means is you can actually have a trigger with the same name on three different objects, uh, three different levels of objects, and there's going to be a hierarchy. So if you had form level trigger, a block level trigger, an item level trigger for a when validate item trigger, it would move up. The lowest level would take the precedence um, for the same event when there's, there's more than one you know, trigger that has uh, that name. It moves up. So the scope of a trigger is where an event must occur in order for the trigger to respond. And you have to, when you're designing your form, you have to think about where, um, what it is that's going to call this trigger and what it is that, you know, creates the need for this trigger. So if we have like a win validate item trigger at the block level, here's an example of following that up from the item to the block to the form you can have a win validate item at each level. See, here's, um, here I'm going to show it to you in more detail. You can see on the object navigator, on the instructor ID of a win validate item, on the instructor of the data block, I have a win validate item, and on the, on the form, um, I also have a win validate item. So basically, the, the, the item level, win validate item, is what's going to go first, and it's going to go after I tab out of that the user tabs out of that item. And then the block is after you tab out of the whole block. And then the form is when you leave the whole form, meaning you're like going to another record. So uh, these also can be controlled by different properties if you want one to override you know, another one. But that, that's just the basic state. So here's a good example of a win validate item trigger. And what this is is um, uh, you're entering, this is uh, when a a user is entering a new student, and they're entering a zip code. And then on the zip code, I would have this trigger. And what you can see is I'm taking the city and the state information, and I'm, I'm actually using this as a way to populate the, the city and state items, which, have, um, which are bind variables, which are on the database, uh, the data block but they're not database items, which I'm filling in by this trigger. I'm also going to use pretty much the same code on a post query. And I'm tying it in to when the zip code equals the bind variable for the student zip. And um, the exception here means that when, that when that select statement is going to return zero rows, which means that that zip code would not exist, then it's going to hit this when no data found. And then it'll give this message, the zip code is not in the database. And it'll also raise a form failure, form trigger failure, which means that it will not allow 
the database to be, um, you, you can't save, commit the data at that point. So now this is a little um, thing that you, you also have in the, the chapter. I'm going to go over in a little bit more detail right now. Now our database here has audit columns, which are very common. Uh, what this means is we have like a created date, created by, modified date, modified by on every table. And that's a way to maintain, you know, who has been, what users have been changing the data. And basically that is, those four audit columns are something that you, you generally do not want uh, your users to see. Although there are cases that I've dealt with where they, they do also want to have the ability to see it, but not to change it. You know, maybe that comes open in a second window, and you actually have exercises where you do that in this um, in the series here. So, <clears throat> what we would do is we're going to hide those columns, but we still want to make use of them. So we're going to have them in the data block, but they're not going to be visible. And then we're going to populate them with pre-insert, pre-update triggers. So basically, the pre-insert is used to create the values for the audit items prior to inserting. So that would be all four, the created by, created date, use uh, modified by, modified date. And then the pre-update would be just before you update that trigger, the, uh, the audit columns would be changed to these values, and that's handled in that. So the method is basically you need to include all the audit columns in the data block. You can then hide them in the layout editor. You may want to leave them there the first time just so you can see the values to make sure it works or not. Uh, and when you actually work through the lab in Chapter 6, specifically uh, Lab 6.2.3, you'll learn another method using the copy build, in, and that, that's a little more flexible. You can write less triggers. Because the way we have it here, um, this is a, a simpler method, but it means that you're going to have to write a trigger on each block. So the trigger here, you can see it's taking the, the user um, and the system date, sys date, selecting it from dual and just populating into those four bind variables that I, I just discussed as the audit bind variables. Now when you do the pre-update, uh, that's just going to update the modified by and the modified date. And actually, what you can see here is um, I've only included half of this, like modified by, created by, but it would be a good idea, uh, depending on the, the um, <clears throat> the data block that you had, that you have the full, the full uh, name of the, the bind variable there, student bot modified by. Uh, and then just as an extra tip, one thing which I found in using both the copy builds in and this is depending on the NLS date format used in your database, that's a whole other issue. We're not going to go there right now, but it's something you need to be aware of or you can speak with your DBA about. Um, and you, you may have to add the following date format maps to handle the modified date and the created date, even though they're not being shown on the, um, <clears throat> on the, the form itself. This is a way to handle any potential Y2K issues. I found that this one, the DDMONRR, will handle most of them. And just as an aside, the RR is the Oracle's date format, which would take, say, during uh, the current century, uh, during the first 50 years of the current century, if you add zero, zero, it'll say that's the first year of this century. So we're um, just a few years after the year 2000. If you use zero, zero, it'll be, it'll turn that into 2000. Uh, just one more point here. Now that you've, you've added all those different uh, triggers and everything, it's important that you test your form completely. And what does it mean to test your form? That means your form should be able to create a new record update an existing record, and delete an existing record. So a good way to try this is you can run your form in run times, um, make some of those changes, and then um, go into SQL Plus and check that your changes have been committed. Uh, what I'm just going to speak briefly about now are forms built in. This is a set of PL SQL functions and procedures that perform standard application functions on the client side. Client side means, you know, in your form. And uh, there's a, a large list of these, and it's good to become familiar with them. This gives you, the more of these that you're familiar with, the more options you have of different things that you can do to your form. And um, some of the most common ones I've listed here. 
such as exit form, which makes leaves the form. Get application property would be a way of getting an app, a, a certain property, assigning it to a variable, and then you may have an if statement based on what that property is. I want to do this or this in your trigger. Set window property would, would change the window property. Um, find the block would be to locate something, to find a window, and go item, go window. These Actually, you'll notice that go item and go window is also a way for you to move uh, to maybe a different block or a different... Um, <clears throat> So would you, we will actually make use of more and more of these built-ins as we go through the different um, triggers as, through the rest of this book, and you'll become familiar with some more of them. So the, the demonstration uh, that follows this lecture is making use of the, um, the form EX0601, which you have, and we'll just go through the basic steps of triggers, and then you're going to continue and read the chapter and do all the labs, and you'll have a very solid understanding of triggers.